Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Thomas Parham, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs here at the University of California, Irvine. I'm also an alumni of this illustrious institution, having graduated in 1976 and left in 1977. And today, as part of our 50th anniversary celebration, I have the honor and privilege of interviewing one of our distinguished faculty, Dr. Joseph L. White. Dr. White, let me say good afternoon to you and welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Tom. It's uh, great to be here with you. So how you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing just fine for a retiree. For a retiree. So just a few days shy of what will be your 82nd birthday, if I count. Right. That's right. My 82nd birthday, big time. So what's that like to be distinguished psychologist, African-American male at UC Irvine, 82 years old? Well, number one is I've outlived the numbers. A black man don't have a long life in America. So I've had the good fortune to outlive the numbers. And when I came into this world 82 years ago, I had four marks against me. I was black, I was poor, I was from a single parent home, and I was a male. So that predicted me on a sociological line to go straight to the prison and die young. So I've had the good fortune to outlive all that. Hmm. So hopefully during our time together this afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to kind of peel back some of those layers and really figure out what the secrets were to some of that. Um, as we think about the 50th anniversary at the University of California, Irvine, you have been such an important part of that, both for your academic instruction, for the clinical work you've provided, the administration, and most importantly, I think the impact that you've also had on students. So let's see if we can't start there with the beginning. Talk to us, if you can, about your arrival at UC Irvine. What got you here? And what made you decide to say yes to an invitation to come here as opposed to any place else? Well, let's start in the spring of 1965 when the administration building was in the library on the top floor and a young white psychologist named Alan Miller, who was on the faculty, who had worked with me in Long Beach and in social activism in Santa Ana, asked me to come and talk to Dan Aldrich, who had recently been appointed the chancellor of the university, which would open in the fall of 1965, I believe. And so Dr. Uh, Aldridge laid out his vision of what the university would look like in the coming years. He wanted to build a world-class university with a focus on science, and he wanted a student body that looked like America, which meant having Mexican-Americans as they were then and black students. And in the entering class at UC Irvine was one black student whose name was Ron Ridgell, who later became the student body president. So we started with one black student, I think, and two Asians. And so he told me he wanted the university to look like America, and it didn't yet look like America. So I was impressed with his vision of building this great university and making it look like America. And at the time, I was a young professor at Long Beach State. I didn't come right then. I didn't come till four years later because I went up to San Francisco State for a year, then I came back down here. But it was his leadership that brought me here. Mm, okay. So as he had a vision for how he wanted to grow the campus and build the campus, you, I suspect, had to have a personal vision yourself about what you wanted to accomplish when you got into the environment. Talk to us a little bit about your own personal vision about how you saw yourself really impacting this environment we call UC Irvine. Well, I wanted to do three things in this environment. First of all, it was the first PhD university I had the opportunity to teach in. So I wanted to build a cadre of diverse graduate students in the social sciences, not only in psychology, but in poli-sci, anthro, and sociology. So that offered me that opportunity. Second, it had a medical school and we definitely need doctors from diverse communities, especially Native American, Chicano, and Black. So that was my second vision. And my third vision was that they wanted to start a Black Studies program. And I had been part of the 
initiation of black studies at San Francisco State, which started the first department in the modern era. And then number four, I said three, but number four is we could attract undergraduate students, especially from South Central LA and Compton and the Bay Area. Mm. So that, that those were my goals. Okay. So having been part of planting those seeds here on campus and trying to realize part of Dan Aldridge's vision that the campus would look like America, as you take a look at UC Irvine now, some 40 plus years later, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts was it's one-sided in terms of looking like America and what's missing in this look of this campus that is majority ethnic at this point is black students. Mm -hmm. So at one time back in the late 60s and early 70s, we were the largest minority on campus, black students, because we deliberately recruited them from the Bay Area, South Central LA and Compton. So we were at the top of the, uh, the totem pole and now we're on the bottom and we've had years when less than 1% of the students on this campus were black. So I come here every Thursday morning, and the first thing I do walking from the parking lot to the social science building is count black students. And some mornings I don't see zero. So you don't have to give me the statistics, I can count. Uh, so that, that didn't happen. But the medical school, which started as an osteopathic college, that became a reality and we have started producing medical students, and we have begun to graduate black PhDs in the social sciences, so that was accomplished. And the ethnic studies took a downturn in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but then we return now, and we have a Department of African American Studies and a Department of Chicano Studies. So I've seen the rise and the fall. Okay, okay. Um, staying back in those early years for a moment, um, the campus prides itself nowadays on having a medical center, uh, and the UC Irvine Douglas Hospital is a magnificent uh, facility that provides uh, a high quality and standard of health care for this entire Orange County community and really the region. Um, but it was possible that Irvine might not have even had a medical school or that medical center. Do you remember those days? And, and talk to us, if you can, about your role and even influence in some of that decision with the legislature. Well, what happened was that we inherited an osteopathic college when we started UCI in 1965. Then we ran the osteopaths out of there and tried to call it a medical school and trained MDs. And the second thing was, and the chancellor got on me about this, Chancellor Drake, the Orange County uh, Hospital was a raggedy ass medical hospital. So we had this osteopathic college we were trying to turn into a medical school, and we had this raggedy ass uh, 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 county hospital. So a bond issue came through somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, that authorized the creation of four new medical schools in the UC system one of which was UCI. And the money for the bond issue came through Assemblyman Willie Brown, who later became the Speaker of the State Assembly and the Mayor of San Francisco. Anyway, the money came through him. So Willie came down here to visit the medical school, and out of 440 medical students, there was one black student. So Willie counted that one and said, well, no way will I release this money with one black student out of 440. You got to be kidding me. So he took me and the chancellor and the old dean of the medical school out in the back room and told him point blank, I'm not releasing this money until Joe White says okay. And then the people said, well, how come Willie and Joe are together? They said, well, them two brothers went to San Francisco State together and they used to stand out on the street drinking wine and talking philosophy. That's how they know each other. And the lobbyists didn't know that we had done it. So then about a month later, we appointed a new medical school dean, a great guy named Dr. Stan Vander Norton. He was a cardiac specialist. He had no problem 
admitting black students to the med school, number one. And he had no problems in transitioning uh, the county hospital into UC Medical Center, center and building a first class uh, 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 hospital medical center. Anyway, the long and the short of that was I traveled all summer long to find 10, 15 black medical students and put them in Verano Place. And out of that first 10 or 15, I found three PhDs in biological science, physiology, teaching at community college. So we put them over there. And then number one, we said, every day we were gonna have study sessions. Every day, all the notes from the classes would be ready at five o'clock. Number three, we would have counselors available. They said I was babying the students and so forth. But anyway, it worked. And five years later, we had all those services available to all 440 medical students. And Dan Rather from CBS came out here and interviewed our then associate dean of the medical school, Horace Mitchell, right out there in Aldrich Park, because we had the best balance in the country of ethnic students, women, and percentage of students graduating. And they adopted the study plan and the notes for all of our students. And Dr. Mitchell is now the president of Cal State Bakersfield. Interesting, so we went from a space where there was a vision to create uh, a nice medical center and a thriving medical school that really lacked the diversity that even was part of the chancellor's vision. Um, you certainly had a hand in being able to provide that validation and affirmation to Willie Brown and the state legislature that we were prepared to do that. But with the right people in place and the right vision, it has now grown up and blossomed into a medical school that produced that kind of diverse excellence. Right, and the medical center is one of the best in the country. Yeah. You know, it's you know, all over the airport, come to UCI Medical Center, you get the best treatment in the world. And I believe your mother was a patient over there exactly. at one time. Exactly. And so it, it, it demonstrated to me what can be done if you've got the right people in the right place. And they couldn't say in the medical school I was an outsider because they appointed me to the uh, Department of Psychiatry to count me for affirmative action. So I was counted in five places for affirmative action. I was only one person, but they had to count me five times. So they couldn't say I was an outsider. They couldn't say Willie, who had the money, was an outsider. And so we worked it. And uh, uh, we had that kind of power back in the 60s, and it, we made it work, 60s and 70s. So you've talked about counting in five places. Let's talk about some of those places, because in your career, as I've known you, you've been both an academician, a clinician, a researcher, uh, an administrator. So let's talk about your academic department. What was your host department? My host department, when I first came here, was the program in black studies, which was later named African American studies. Then it folded into comparative culture, which brought in the other ethnic cultures. Then at the same time, I was temporarily part of the faculty of social ecology, and I was also part of the faculty of psychiatry. And then for a couple of semesters or quarters, I was an assistant vice chancellor of academic affairs. So that's, and I was part-time in the counseling center as the supervisor. So that was five or six places I was counted. Right. Just one black guy, you know. So, illustrates the importance of having versatility right. Right, in your day, okay. Right, and even people with degrees in mathematics have trouble counting accurately. <laughs> understandable, understandable. Uh, you mentioned the counseling center as well. You've had just a, a, a big footprint, I think, in, in, uh, uh, in its development. Talk to us, if you can, about the development of the counseling center that plays such an important role on campus today. Well, what happened was there was no counseling center when I came here in 1969. And I'd always been part of counseling centers, even though my degree is in clinical psych, from Michigan State forward. So when I came here, there was no counseling center. And we had some white hippie types as students who used to hang around black people. We only had a few black people, but them hippies used to hang with us. And those hippies used to smoke a lot of dope and stuff. They had a house down in Costa Mesa. Anyway, they got to smoking dope one night or LSD or something, and the girl freaked out 
and saw lions up on the wall and carrying on. So I'm always listed in the phone book. So the hippies called me, got me up out the bed in the middle of the night to get this girl winding down up off this freaking out. So when I finally calmed her down, I knew she had to be hospitalized. So I took her to Hogue Hospital and signed the chancellor's name, okay? Mm. And then I had some breakfast when the cafeteria opened and then I waited till eight o'clock when I knew the chancellor would be over in his office and told him what happened and said, you can't let this kind of thing go down uh, at this university, this modern university, you need some kind of counseling center. So he said, yeah, what do you want? So he gave me three FTEs and a secretary and a building over in the old engineering complex and that's where we started. That's number one. Number two is, I said from the beginning that I wanted a developmental model in the sense that these 18 to 24 year olds are going through a process of development from late adolescence to early adulthood and they just encounter challenges. There's nothing wrong with these kids. They're not sick or nothing like that. I just want a set of counselors that can facilitate development. That's what I was interested in. I wasn't depathologizing anybody. So we got started, I hired the staff, then I went on back to my other five jobs and then three years later, the counseling center wanted to be accredited by the American Psych Association. So they needed a licensed psychologist. So I was the only one on campus, so I had to go back over there and supervise the young psychologist till they could get licensed and then we could get accredited. So then I just stayed over there a quarter time as one of my five jobs. And then the counseling center developed into a world-class institution with the multicultural model which then Tom Parham and Horace Mitchell put together and said that we are going to develop not only a developmental model, but it's gonna have a multicultural emphasis in the sense that we understand we're getting students from different backgrounds, ethnically, and also immigrant students. And now at the final stage, the Counseling Center now is leading the system-wide UC system to talk about mental health of students and building a healthy student psychologically as well as academically. And we just had the big conference that UCI was instrumental in planning system-wide in September in LA. Not only system-wide, but we had the Cal State system there, community colleges there, and the private colleges. And then two psychologists, Tom Parham and Taisha Caldwell, who did their training right here at Irvine, we're part of the leadership of the conference. So we're putting together a system-wide mental health process that will benefit all students. We're gonna teach them how to cope with challenges. That's what we're gonna do. Mm. So we've talked about some of your administrative roles. We've talked about the academic roles in teaching in African studies and comparative culture. We've talked about also footprint in the counseling center. Um, I want to talk for a moment about just the research and the contributions that you've made since you've been here in the writing. Because your scholarship has been really seminal in some respects because you are considered to be uh, what we call the godfather of the black psychology movement. How did that name come about and how would you describe your unique contribution to that discipline? Well, when I went through graduate school, Black people were invisible in psychology. We were invisible in the textbooks, we were invisible in the faculty. California was the second biggest state in the union. There was not nary a one black PhD psychologist in this whole state. So we were invisible. So we're talking about psychology, graduate school in both San Francisco State as well as in Michigan State. Because you finished Michigan State, if I remember right, in 1961 61. as the one of uh, less than a handful of African-American PhD psychologists in the country. In the country, and I was number five, okay. I was number five. So then I get out of graduate school, we're invisible. And then number two is, when we were slightly visible, it was under what you call the deficit deficiency model. That is when we were visible, they said we was dumb, that we was ugly, that we was manic depressive because we ran away from the master, uh, and so forth, kleptomania, dreptomania, or something like that. And it was a contradiction. First of all, I could look in the mirror and see that I was visible. And I had three young children, so that it wasn't invisible, and a wife. So uh, 
that was a contradiction. The second contradiction was my mother raised three children with a high school education by herself, got us all through high school, kept us out of jail, kept us clothed and fed. And so that's a complex task. No, no dumb person could do that complex task. So I faced this contradiction. And furthermore, I took it personal. You're not gonna call my mama Doug and uh, dumb and ugly, because then I get all excited. And I know you're not supposed to take it personal, but I took it personal. Mm, okay. So I said, I don't believe this traditional psychology. Even though I'd been trained in it, I no longer believe it. So what we call that Eurocentric model of psychology was not either relevant or reflective of the life experience of the larger black community. Right, and you can tell I'm getting excited now talking. That's how I got excited when I first discovered it. So now I got this contradiction and I found out it's easier to say what you don't believe than what you do believe. Mm. It's easier to critique something than it is to create something. So people kept asking me, well, if you think this white psychology is racist and you don't believe in this deficit deficiency and you don't believe you dumb and ugly, well, then what do you believe? So now I got to sit back and think. And up to that time, I think I was 31 years old, if I wanted to learn something new in psychology, I could go find a professor or somebody older than me to teach me. But well, it was no black psychology, so there's no one to teach me. So now I got to figure this thing out. And by that time, there were three or four more black psychologists, so we would be talking. But they said, well, you're an academician. You write something down. So I wrote something down at the beginning. It was not the answer to everything. I just raised some questions, and it was in a little journal we started called The Black Scholar, Guidelines for Black Psychologists. Well, Ebony Magazine read that little article in the little journal, and they called me up and said, would you rewrite this thing so an 11th grade person could read it? That meant it was popular psychology. Everybody could read it. So I rewrote the article and they put it in Ebony Magazine and Ebony has a circulation of one million uh, copies. And then, because it's in the library and in the beauty shop, barbershop, pool hall, five people read each edition. So if you got a million out there, then you got five readers, you got a five million dollar hit. Five million hit. So five million subscribers to Ebony Magazine one million subscribers, five readers. One million subscribers, five readers. So five million uh, readers will actually read the article, potentially, That's right. compared to uh, an intellectual or psychological journal from an academic discipline where the readership may be five, 10, 15,000, 20,000. At the most. At the most. Okay. So now I got this thing out there with five million readers. So everybody in his mama is calling me up here at Irvine asking me about this black psychology business. And then I had to tell them there's two contexts in science. One is the context of discovery, where you state something that you think should be tested. The other context is the context of confirmation. Mm -hmm. So I told them, look here, I'm working in the context of discovery. I'm throwing a set of ideas out there. I think they're valid, but now another generation of young psychologists got to come along and see if they can validate what I said. And that's how it got started. And I still get people calling me up about that 1970 article. Well, it was a classic article for uh, the viewers who uh, don't know what we're referring to. This was an article that was entitled Toward a Black Psychology. And the article ultimately was published in the first edition of a compendium of, of articles by Reginald Jones called Black Psychology. It was the, the seminal book at the time first published, I think, in 1972. But that article you're talking about at Ebony Magazine was actually published in 1970, a couple years before then, that then went to the broader distribution of black America, not simply to the academic elite, right, who kind of restricted to those particular intellectual spaces that they occupy. Right, and then I got accused not only of the black psychology, but then they said I brought racism into psychology. Then they said I popularized psychology, which was supposed to be a scientific discipline. And now everybody in his mama is running around here popularizing psychology. You go to a big old bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, they got a half a bookstore full of psychology books, how to learn to love yourself, how to build a relationship. And psychology is very popular, but when I popularized it, then I got criticized. 
Okay. But that's just the nature of being, right? right? Uh, well, I had to learn. You had to learn that. I that's had it. to learn. That's it. So among your scholarly works you've done, certainly the article toward a black psychology, but then came the troubled adolescent book. Then came Black Men Emerging. And of course, you and I have had the uh, uh, opportunity to collaborate on the Psychology of Black series. It's now in its fourth uh, uh, writing of that, of uh, the fourth edition. Uh, what's been some of the most important ideas and concepts you've tried to articulate in your scholarship over all these years? Well, what I've tried to do at baseline is say that science represents a combination of ideas. And I've tried to take that combination of ideas, talk about black folks, talk about adolescents, talk about black men emerging, talk about black fathering, and so forth. So I've tried to take that combination of ideas and use that to enrich the profession. So I've been very fortunate in having been part of a zeitgeist where I caught the curve at just the right time. Mm -hmm. And it just propelled me forward. Mm -hmm. So as you think about even catching that idea and looking at that, uh, talk to us in, in a little bit more specificity about you know, what were the two or three or four core things you wanted to get across to folk and all the ideas? There are themes that flow throughout each of your writings. Well, I think the theme that flows through my writing is IWOK, that's what the Native American brothers call it, indigenous ways of knowing. That I believe that science flows not from the empirical statistical method, but from experience. And I then grounded my work in experience. For example, I mentioned having a long life for a brother. Well, I went to a conference. I had to substitute for my buddy who backed out on why black men don't have a long life. That was a thing of the conference, why we die eight, 10 years younger than uh, white folks. And so everybody had all these charts and graphs and everything, and man, so many numbers, I was overwhelmed. So I was the last speaker. I got no graphs, I got no numbers, I got nothing. And they asked me, I said, well, it came from my experience. That's where I got the idea that they died uh, uh, nine or 10 years younger, I said, and look here, I think I was 61 years old then, that half of my peer group had died before they was 50. I said, so I, I can count. I mean, so I was flowing from experience, I-W-O-K, indigenous ways of knowing, and they were trying to flow from a mathematical statistical method. Mm. So I was anchored in experience and they were anchored up in their computers and stuff. So one of those themes I I've, I've recall that you are really talking about a lot is belief in the value of direct experience. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Belief in the value of direct experience. And when a black child takes an intelligence test, they answer the question from direct experience, whereas the test constructor answers it in another way. So if you ask a child, a uh, 13-year-old black child, what should you do? You say, oh, questions if you see a train approaching a broken track. The answer is you run out there and wave a red flag. That's what the test constructor says. But the brother who's on probation says, hell no, I ain't going to run out there with no flag. You know, my probation officer will violate me if this train, uh, train is in a wreck and I'll have to go back to juvenile hall. Or even just the inner city kid who yeah. may have no record at all. Yeah but in fact will likely get blamed for something happening yeah. as opposed to being a hero in that context. Right. So then we got to rescore the test. That's what we did up in the Larry P case in the Bay Area where they had all those black children in the mentally retarded class. So we rescored it. Did it make sense from the child's experience? Variable scoring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Let's, let's come back home to UC Irvine for a minute because where you and I first met was in the classroom. Right. And, uh, your class uh, sometimes taught two days a week, oftentimes taught one three-hour block uh, with a break in between, was, was just uh, a happening every week. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a regular class that people came to get some knowledge and then left. There were people who would bring, I remember bringing their family, relatives, friends, girlfriends, you know, my mom was in town. She would just come to, you know, kind of sit because people there. What is it about 
that class that you taught in African psychology, something else that really helped people to really gravitate in those spaces? Well, I think what helped them gravitate the space in African American psychology, I mean, rather adolescent psychology, was they had all been adolescents, whether they was the students, the parents of the students, and we had grandparents come too, mm -hmm. and kids. Everybody could relate to having once been a teenager. So that was the space I was able to capture them in. And then I just built on the experiences that they had as teenagers or knew about as teenagers or remembered as teenagers and they could just grab onto that and go with it. And then of course it was a three hour class so we had to you know show off a little bit, entertain them and so forth. People sitting in uh, uh, thing in the aisle and the fire, fire marshal came and he let us let him set up and there was what 600 people in that class something like that and then it wasn't that you met me when you first came here because I knew your brother right. and he said I got a brother meaning you a biological brother over at Long Beach State playing basketball wanting to be the police I said well no 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 we, we, we got to get away from all that now <laughs> and so he said, I'm going to bring my brother over here to Irvine. I said, well, bring the brother on over to Irvine. And so then you came to Irvine, and then we was out on that walkway, and we had a come to Jesus meeting. So lots of folk who, who uh, won't know that expression, kind of come to Jesus meeting, want you to explain that, but it, co it corresponds with my memory very much so about I had taken your class. Uh, so this is maybe a month or two after class. Mm -hmm. And you were walking up, I assume coming from the faculty club, because it was about lunchtime. Yeah, right over there. And I was coming down from, uh, uh, in the social science area. And we met, and I just kind of respectfully said, hey, afternoon, Dr. White, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Right? And that was kind of how we met after class. Mm -hmm. And then, what do you remember about that? Because I want to make sure our memories. Well, clear. what I remember is us meeting on the walkway after the class. And you had already been in my class, and I knew you from your biological brother, but I knew you were from the inner city, South Central LA. I had grown up in an inner city in Minneapolis, so that was common ground. I knew you were from a one-parent family, that was common ground. You was black and male, that's common ground. And so we had a common experience base to start with, okay? And so I knew you had been playing basketball, and I didn't play college ball, but I played high school ball, ran track. So I'd done the athletic thing and so forth. And I'm not above saying I had a few girlfriends over time, you know what I mean? And so I knew you was into that. So then I stopped you on the walkway and I said, let's talk. And I knew you'd done well in my class. So I said, look here, brother, you know what I mean? It's time to stop shucking and jiving, you know what I mean? Let's, let's talk about the real deal, where we're going with life. Now you're already down, you're not a teenager no more, so let's, put this basketball down and get rid of some of these women and let's talk about the future. And I said, I have office hours on Thursday. I said, I want you to come see me next Thursday. And that's when I wrote on that board, I laid out the whole next seven years. I remember chalkboard maybe this big. Generations now know dry erase markers. Chalkboard was about this big and diagrammed my whole future upon the chalkboard. And it was really life-changing and doggone if, if almost everything didn't come to pass. It came to pass, and I said, I'm going to do exactly to you what was done to me. You're in the West Coast, now I'm going to send you out to the Midwest. I didn't know whether it be Michigan State, ended up being Southern Illinois, but I mentioned Michigan State and Wisconsin. I said, we got, you know, a network out there, I'm going to send you out there. Then we're going to bring you back here for your internship, and then after that, we'll see what you want to do with your life. And then after that, you took your first job, tenure track at Penn, then we brought you on back here. And then I've often said this, and I believe it with my heart and soul, that if you're a good teacher, your students should excel you. Because you share what you got, then they put that together with what they got, and they should make two and two come out four or five, rather than just do the same thing I did with my life. You're supposed to add on to that. And one of my most gratifying moments, Dr. Parham, was I was at an APA convention, American Psychological, about three years ago, and a lady came running out of one of your lectures. And that lady was a white lady. She was all wound up. Oh, Dr. Parham this, and Dr. Parham that. And she looked at my name tag and said, UC Irvine. She said, well, do you know Dr. Parham? I said, oh, yes, ma'am, I know him. 
And she said, well, you, have you ever had a course from him? I said, well, <laughs> I said, not exactly. You know, I mean, I know the brother, <coughs> you know. So that meant, you know, whatever you taught that lady had aroused her, you know what I mean? And she thought that I was your student. She got it mixed up. A little right? bit of role reversal. Yeah. <laughs> role reversal. So the mentoring that I have prized and really just loved over my life is the same kind of experience that other students at Irvine have had. And part of what I think endears people to the campus is not simply the aesthetic ambiance and the beauty of the buildings, but it's the people. And you are so much an important part of people's lives, and they are white, Latino, Asian, Indian, you know, African American, other folk. What's been special about that mentoring experience that you've tried to give students while you've been here? Well, I try to do two things with students. Number one, is I've tried to tell them that you can take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. You're 19, 20 now. Now let's talk about the next level. Is it med school, becoming a judge, a lawyer, something like that, going to grad school in psychology? I don't care whether you're male, female, black, you could take it to the next level. Then the second piece is they can see people not much older than them who are taking it to the next level. The freshmen can see seniors, the seniors can see some of my graduate students because I take them to conventions. They can see some early career psychologists. They can see the whole thing laid out from the time they're 19 till they're 50. It's almost like a vertical team at every level. They can see yeah. it. Right. It's just not me just saying something. They can see it. I say Tom Parham or his brother was in this class 10 years ago, sitting right where you're sitting now and now He's the vice chancellor, he's running this counseling center, or he's president of Cal State Bakersfield. They were sitting right here where you're sitting now. And you got as much ability as they do. And so I make the human contact. And it's not so much I spend all that much time with people, but it's the quality of the human contact. And then they begin to internalize that. Well, if this dude believes in me, and I see all these people he's worked with, and he thinks I can be just like them, then maybe he's telling me something that is the truth. And then once they start to believe that, then they start to be productive, and then it's self-reinforcing. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we have a few moments left for our interview, but I want to try to touch base on where we were. So when the campus was first developed back in 1964, mm -hmm. the President of the United States, then Lyndon Johnson, flew in on Army One. Mm -hmm. The shovel in the ground dedicated the land that we now call UC Irvine. Fifty years later, we had an opportunity to invite the current president of the United States, Barack Obama, and he came to deliver the commencement address in June of 1964, 50 years later. What's that moment like for the campus, and why was that particular piece important to be able to close that circle? Well, I think it's a beautiful thing. 1964, President Lyndon Baines Johnson and his great society and the then governor, Brown, Edmund Brown Sr. stood right out there and a bulldozer dug a big old hole and they had a shovel. I was standing right behind them because I was in Long Beach State. And they said, we're gonna build this university to represent this great society. And we're gonna have science and engineering and biologies and social science, and we're going to do that. So they dug that hole in the ground. They had not nary a one student. Here we are 50 years later, world-class university, written up in academic magazines and journals, top 50, uh, 30,000 students almost, Nobel Prize winners. We've had two, maybe three, and STEM. And to, to look out there as I walk, and think of that big hole in the ground is just fantastic. Shows you what you can do when you put your mind to something. And the, another interesting contrast is when we started the interview, you talked about um, kind of this air of cultural sterility that really permeated the campus and how it was less reflective of the state of California or the nation that both the chancellor and everybody had a vision for. So 50 years later, when Barack Obama comes, you have a lot of ironic first. You have a very diverse platform party that's there with the deans and vice chancellors and other folk. 
but you have the first African-American president of the United States. You have the first African-American chancellor in the history of the University of California system, and the current chancellor at UC Irvine at that point, Michael Drake, on the stage, right? Along with the vice chancellor, legal counsel, other folk. What was that feel like in terms of that picture of diversity for you? Well, I think the picture of diversity was, for me, that platform, I watched it on TV, I wasn't there. It looked like the vision that Dan Aldrich had. You have a black president, 50 years later you had the white president, Lyndon Johnson, you got a black chancellor of the university. So it began to look like that vision. The problem was, and we're going to struggle with it for the next few years, is the faculty doesn't look like that vision, nor does part of the student body. And we've got something we just have to work on. So it takes us into the, where we're going now, which is, as you had a, a, a hope for the future, a vision of possibility for our next 50 years, we are grown folk now. Mm -hmm. So we are 50 years old as a campus moving into the whole next you know, half century. What would be your vision? What would you like to see the campus really focus on in that time? I would like to see the campus focus on truly making the faculty look like America. And as you know, I visit 15, 20 campuses a year. I go to Harvard, Notre Dame, University of Michigan, and I see people looking like America. Then I come home to my own campus and I don't see that same diversity. So I know it can be done. I don't know how they do it there, but I can see that it can be done. So I want to see that and I want a student body that's a little bit more reflective of black America. That's what I want for the next 50 years. We've got the science, uh, we've got the Nobel Prize winners, we've got grants just coming out of everywhere. We're a world-class university. So all those parts have been actualized. So now we got some more growth parts. Hmm. Putting that in play. So finally, I want to say that in the context of that, um, part of the, the culture of the campus has not just been our academic excellence and the ambiance here, but has also been really the small town feel where people were able to connect with each other in authentic ways and really develop those networks of mutual support. So one of the things, I remember us, right when I was getting ready to leave for graduate school, and my colleagues, Dr. Larry Jackson and Aldous Patterson, I remember us taking you out to dinner, and we were down on Pacific Coast Highway somewhere not far from here. And I remember us saying to you, Dr. White, you've invested so much in us and we are so grateful. How do we thank you? And you very politely said, I appreciate your thanks, but don't need it. But what I do expect is that you do for others what I did for you. So if you had to leave a message for the faculty, for the staff, for the administration here about what to do with these students in terms of that mentoring context, what would you say? Well, I think people learn from role models and from direct experience. So over the years, we've had, what, 150, 200 PhDs come through our network. And one of the most gratifying pieces is what I said to you and Larry and Aldridge and them when you took me out, is once I handed the baton off to the mentees, you guys picked it up. Mm. And so we have Jeanette Cassianos over there in social science. Now that girl's only been out of graduate school 18 years and she's already got 35 PhDs out on the market. And they got publications, as you well know, you know what I mean. She signs them out of here with two or three publications going to grad school. So some people have internalized what they've experienced and I don't have to tell them to repeat it, they just do it. So that if we can strengthen, even though we're a bigger college now with almost 30 thousand students, strengthen that mentorship so that the students experience it, then they will pass it on. And if they don't experience it, then they won't pass it on. So help contribute to really the, the qualitative aspects of the student learning, not just the quantitative aspects and the number. Now I want to add something to this interview. Okay. I've been out of graduate school 53 years, somewhere in there. I had no idea 
that all of this was going to happen to me. When I left graduate school, I was trained traditionally. I wanted to be a teacher and a child psychologist. And I started out to be that, but then as your boy crumbles, called career happenstance, other events came along and turned me upside down, and I ended up being the godfather. But I had no idea that that was going to happen when I left graduate school. I thought I would just get a little old job somewhere, teaching in a little liberal arts college, teach my psych on end, going home, mind my business. Well, and it reminds me really of two things. First, some old grandma wisdom. I know our grandmamas who never met probably shared that said, you got to make a way out of no way. Mm -hmm. But the second one was a piece of wisdom that you shared, which is when you sent me to graduate school, you said, I'm not sending you there to be clinically good. I want you to be clinically good, research good, and academically good. Because the key to mental health for a man of your generation is to always have a broad range of choices and options. Mm -hmm. And it's choices and options that has really helped to make the difference. And for you to be able to create those options. And create the options. Yeah, I just, just don't want you to take what they gave you at Southern Illinois. What I want you to take that and then take it to some next level, next level. and create the options. And I've had more options than I could dream of ever having in one lifetime. But I didn't set out to do that. Right. I just want to be a child psychologist, mind my business, teach my class 101A. Child psychologist, first African American from Michigan State to graduate with a PhD in psychology. Uh, Long Beach State professor, San Francisco State professor, UC Irvine professor, licensed psychologist in the state of California. You've had just a stellar career. And I would argue that this UC Irvine campus has been a much better place and a much more enriching academic uh, experience for students because of you've been here. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us who are reflecting back on 50 years for being such an important part. Thank About you. 50 years later. Keep the faith. Thank you, Dr. White. So I recall myself uh, being a young student growing up in Los Angeles, California, product of both public and parochial school environments, uh, who grew up in the marvelous militancy of the 60s and 70s. And as I thought about that experience, uh, I was impacted by some of the events that took place Watts riots of 65, some of the strife and turmoil, the racism that existed by just growing up black and male in America back then. And there were really two choices that they gave young black men. One was to be a revolutionary and try to overthrow the system. The other was to try to be more of an integrationist and really work from within the system to change it. And I always came from the space where my mama taught us that you shouldn't be whining about anything unless you're willing to put something better in this place and do better. So I set out being impacted negatively by the LAPD to try to impact the criminal justice system because I knew that I had a, a, a heart and a spirit that wanted to make a difference and to do some, some, some good in the world. Unfortunately, as I got to pursue that, which is why I went to Long Beach State, both playing basketball and studying criminology, I found myself being frustrated with the criminal justice system because it required really more ability to manipulate the system than it did really to help anybody. But fortunately, while I was at Cal State Long Beach, I had an opportunity to intern uh, first at a halfway house for incorrigible and runaway kids, so-called. And the second was in the community psychology clinic in downtown Long Beach. And there, I was able to receive some very valuable feedback from parents who said, wow, my child is really benefiting from the work you're doing, or supervisors at the clinic who said, you know, you got a knack for this. And part of figuring out what you want to do in life is not just figuring out what you're interested in, but rather what are you good at? Where's your skill base at? And my skill base, I thought, was in with people. So transferring to Irvine was a space that would push me. The other piece that was important about coming to Irvine was that I grew up being a relatively bright child. I was blessed to be bright. But I've stylized that piece of African wisdom over time that says that, that life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites and fruitful harmony. Tr literally translated means sometimes your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. My greatest strength was being real bright. But it also made me real lazy as a student because I didn't have to work hard to do well. 
And so it's that kind of space that made it real difficult to do that. But when I got into places like um, Cal State, it wasn't challenging me academically in a way in which I needed to be challenged because I could still go to class and pay attention and still do pretty well. So coming to Irvine was a whole different academic experience. Coming to your class was a whole different academic experience. And I was also very typical of, of black and Latino and Asian kids, Native American kids who were very relational kids. So we perform well when professors and teachers care about you. And that really was, was part of the start of what happened at Irvine. So come to Irvine, have a wonderful experience, had the privilege of serving as your teaching assistant for a couple of years. And even having left that role, your instruction was to find the next you who's going to take your place even as you then go on. Went to grad school, started at Washu in St. Louis, got my master's degree, and then went on to Southern Illinois. Came back here to do my clinical internship, and then was exploring the different options and choices, and then was recruited to join the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. I remember the day I got the letter in the mail that said, we'd like to offer you a position, and I had not been to Philly other than for that interview. But they laid out about half the world, if you remember, for me to go there. And they had never hired an academic African-American psychologist in Penn's 200-year history. We didn't know that before I left. We knew that once I got there. Um, but it was, a, it was a very humbling kind of space to be in, but one that we thought we could make a difference. But ultimately, I think coming back to Irvine, I was recruited by Horace Mitchell, who you talked about, who was then vice chancellor. And he became vice chancellor after he left being associate dean of the medical school. And I became Horace Mitchell's first recruit you know, after being vice chancellor to come back. And I remember Dr. Mitchell talking to me. And he said, your coming back to campus goes beyond your being an administrator and directing a center. Your job is to help change and shape, really, the culture of the campus and institution in ways that really enhance the student experience. So we've been able to do administrative work, clinical work, and academic work. So we've taught every year since we've been here. And still keep the scholarship and writing up, which has also been real nice. Um, I sit with, with uh, almost uh, uh, an interesting uh, irony because the same folk that we were working with way back with students, we've now become. And now sitting in the role as Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, it's been a both humbling and interesting journey and feeling very blessed to be able to be in that particular role uh, because I pride myself on trying to do the best job I can for students. But a lot of the lessons that I incorporate into the work that I do to be able to enhance the student experience in the same ways that you talked about, in the same ways that you imparted to us and mentored us as we were students under your tutelage, is the same thing I then try to share with students now. And if students tell me, Dr. P, I want to grow up and be like you one day, I'll give them the same lesson that's Joe White 101, which is your job is not to be like me. Your job is to take my little stuff and take it to a whole different level. because. If a teacher's any good at what he or she does, their students, as you say, should always exceed their own goal attainment. And so what I hope when all is said and done is that as both vice chancellor, as uh, a researcher and scholar, as um, an academician still teaching in the classroom, that the sum total of those contributions enrich and enhance the quality of the academic experience that students will have here. And we hope we are continuing to create kind of this multicultural mecca where not only we are surrounding ourselves with um, uh, students from diverse backgrounds, but that even predominantly white students will have an opportunity to be taught by somebody who doesn't just preach a Eurocentric worldview and frame of reference, but they have a, uh, an opportunity to develop a more authentic and genuine understanding of black life and culture than they can get off of watching TV and uh, through the media, which I think is important. Um, but I'm loving being here. Uh, I'm loving being part of the campus. Uh, being an alum of the institution is uh, uh, just a special place for me to be in because I know how important it is. And hopefully we can extend the splendor to other students who we can recruit and yield to come take advantage of all the magnificent ambiance that is in this intellectual uh, place of learning. So hopefully that's what we're looking to do.